We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. We're here on, on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, and we've been in the middle of a series together as a church called Miracles. We've been talking through some miracles of Jesus. If you were here three weeks ago, you would have heard that Jesus was able to heal sick people. He was able to look at someone who was sick and, and heal them of their sickness. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus could take uh, just a little bit of bread and a, few, a couple fish and feed thousands of people that he could say, be fed and feed the multitudes. Last week, we talked about Jesus being able to speak over nature, and he was able to go out and in the midst of a storm say, be still, and the storm ceased. And we've been talking about these miracles of Jesus throughout the, the Gospels, but today... We're going to talk about the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed, which was resurrecting himself. I mean, it's pretty cool to be able to bring someone else back to life, but to bring yourself back to life? In fact, I, I, to illustrate this, I, I found this microphone laying on stage. I'm going to use it. Uh, I think what I would call this miracle is, you ready for this? The mic drop miracle. All right, so you ready? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your fake laugh. Um, it is a uh, an already dead mic. All right, so it's all it's all good, Lou. Um, yeah, we'll kick that out of the way. But yeah, I want you to remember that that Jesus bringing himself back to life. Think of it this way. That's the mic drop miracle. That's like the miracle of all miracles. In fact, what's even better about this mic drop miracle is that Jesus called it ahead of time. He told you he was going to do it. It reminds me, remember before the days of a pitch clock in baseball, right? I don't think you're going to see people do this anymore because they only got a few seconds to get into place, right? But a batter who is really confident maybe and, and knows he's going to hit a home run and can, he gets up to the plate, grabs a bat. Before they get ready, they, they point out into the outfield and point right where they're going to hit the home run. If, if a batter did that today, right, and pointed right where they're going to hit it, and then boom, first pitch, hits the ball right to where they said, home run, that would make Sports Center, wouldn't it? It would. I mean, a lot of people hit home runs on a daily basis during baseball season. Those don't make Sports Center. But when you call it, when you tell people ahead of time the amazing thing you're about to do, and then you do it, that's pretty cool. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus said over and over again, he said, listen, and one of those examples, when Jesus was talking to his disciples in Matthew 16, he actually says, listen, I'm going to be killed. And then three days later, my body is going to come back to life. I'm going to be raised back to life all by myself. He called it. And then he did it. Now, some of you in this room right now, a room this size, there's probably going to be a few skeptics. And there's going to be a few of you that say, well, you only believe about Jesus. And you only believe that he was raised back to life because this book tells you that. But let, let, me, let me argue with you for just a moment, all right? Listen, even atheist historians know that Jesus was a real person that really lived, that claimed that that real person named Jesus thou, a couple thousand years ago claimed to be the Son of God. That really happened. That's not really disputable. Another thing that's not disputable is that that Jesus, if you go to the tomb where his body was placed, there's no body in it anymore. That's not disputable. It, the tomb is empty. 
Now again, you would say, well, that's easy, right? Uh, somebody claims to be Jesus, uh, claims to be God, and then, and then he gets killed, and his body's put in a tomb, and then some people, to, to play a trick on us 2,000 years from now, just go and clear that body out and hide it somewhere, and be like, ah, he was raised to life. But do you know that it's also recorded, uh, hundreds of people are on record seeing Jesus alive after his death seeing a resurrected Christ. In fact, the disciples were so confident of of the fact that their Savior was resurrected back to life. They saw it, they had conversations with him, they put their hands and uh, their fingers in the holes of his wrists and his feet, they knew it was true to the point where they were willing to die a martyr's death. They went to the grave claiming that truth. I don't know about you, but if I'm pulling your pulling your leg on like April 1st or something, I'm not gonna go to the grave pretending that my trick is real. I'm not gonna do it. But people were willing to die for this truth. And what I'm trying to to say to you right now is Jesus really existed. He really claimed to be the son of God. He claimed to be the, the path at which all of us are able to be restored back to the father. He told us he was gonna die in our place and then come back to life three days later and he did it. That's pretty amazing. And here's the, uh, one of the coolest things about this mic drop miracle is that because Jesus conquered death, this mic drop miracle actually invites all of us to participate in this resurrection. We get to participate in this miracle, believe it or not. Let me show you this. Jesus, uh, there's, a, there's a story where Jesus, one of his friends, Lazarus, had died. And Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And so they're sad that their brother has died. Jesus is sad. Everybody's crying. Jesus is crying. And and Jesus comes into the story, and he brings Lazarus back to life. Again, that's pretty cool, being able to bring someone else back to life. Not as cool as bringing yourself back to life, but pretty amazing. And then Jesus says this to Martha. In John 11, verse 25, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. That's a pretty powerful statement that Jesus is claiming. Jesus looks at Martha. He says, listen, anybody who puts their faith in me and their trust in me will never die. Or put it this way, you're all going to physically die, but what he says is you're going to live even after dying. And then he looks at Martha and he asks a very, very significant and important question. It's on the screen. He says this, do you believe this, Martha? In fact, what I think we ought to do this morning is ask this question and remove Martha's name and give you a chance to put your name in that spot, all right? So here's the question. Do you believe this fill in the blank? Do you believe this, Matt? Do you believe this? Put your name in there. And in fact, I wanna suggest to you this morning that this is the most important question you will ever answer in your life. God placed you on this earth at one moment in time to answer this question, do you believe this? In fact, the reason we do all the things that we do around here, the reason we put fancy lights up for Easter and the reason we jump up and down and get excited and sing at the top of our lungs and clap our hands and all the hooping and hollering, the reason we do it is very simple, is that Jesus has changed our life. Jesus is the reason we do what we do around here. In fact, Jesus says this himself in John 14, 6. Jesus is talking to a man and he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus makes a very powerful and bold claim. He doesn't say that he's a way to the Father. He doesn't say that he is a truth or you know, a life. He says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one, not a single person in this room, can make their way back to the Father except across Jesus' shoulders. How many of you, if you have an opportunity to choose, if, if somebody comes up to you and they say, I have good news and I got bad news, how many of you are good news first people? How many of you, raise your hand if you're good news first. A few of you weirdos. All right. 
cool, cool. How many of you are bad news first people? All right, that's usually the typical one. That's where I am. In fact, I'm such a bad news first guy that I eat my muffins upside down. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. You eat the, the, the bummer part first and you get to the muffin top. Ooh, it's gonna change your life, all right? <laughs> so here's what I'm gonna do for you this morning. I wanna share with you the, the bad news first. When Jesus is talking about being the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through him, what is he talking about? Well, the bad news is, all right, is that every single one of us in this room, we are broken and we are messed up. We have sin in our lives. And what sin simply is, is it means we've done things our way instead of choosing God's perfect way for us. And our sin, here's the bad news, our sin separates us from God who is perfectly holy and perfectly righteous. If you want a word picture, imagine like a big ravine with two cliffs on either side. And we're on this side, up, we're up over here at where, where everything's broken and sin has entered the world and we're, we're part of it, we're broken people. And over here on this side is a perfectly holy and righteous God. Now, when he first created everything, he created us so that we would be in perfect standing in relationship with him, that we'd be able to experience an eternal relationship with God. But our sin created this, this chasm between us, this, this inability for us to, in, uh, that's the bad news. Because of your sin, on your own, you are unable to ever experience, you're unable to see heaven, you're unable to be in relationship with God anymore. I'm sorry, all of us are sinners your sin breaks you off from the Father. That's the bad news. And if I just said, hey, you're dismissed, that would be a bummer of a message, wouldn't it? Because there's good news. The good news is this, is that the story doesn't end there. God says in Scripture very clear that he loves you so much that he sent his son to this earth to die on a cross in your place that Jesus came and he lived a perfect life and that essentially because Jesus claimed that he is the way, the truth, and the life, no one can come to the Father except through him. Imagine Jesus basically standing in the gap of that, of that ravine and he's saying, listen, if you wanna get to the other side, the only way is through me. And so God has, has created this pathway that you and I can, can be forgiven of our sin, that we can be seen as holy and righteous. We can place our sin on Jesus who paid for them on the cross. We can place our faith in him and, and then Jesus will, will take care of that. And when God the Father sees me one day after I die and I'm standing before him, he's gonna see the righteousness and holiness and perfection of Jesus instead of my junk. That's the good news. You see, that's the good news. In fact, I, let me put it this way. God sent his perfect son to pay our sin debt on the cross. But I don't want you to miss this. A lot of people think, hey, Jesus came, he paid our sin debt, all of us are, were good. But the truth is, is that that gift of righteousness, that gift of relationship with God the Father, it is only available through Jesus. You can't get it on your own. It's not just something that, that you just, boom, you get it. Jesus died on the cross, it's for everybody. You have to place your faith in him. Remember what he said to Martha. He said, anyone who believes in me will live. And so I'm gonna ask you the question again. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Have you ever wondered what I say to people uh, if, if you're part of this church, you know that pretty much every Sunday these days, we get to see people take that initial step of obedience and faith and get baptized. We get to see them give their life to Christ, and then we get to see them take that first step of obedience and baptism. And sometimes when I'm standing over here, you'll, you'll notice that we're having a conversation. It seems like I'm saying something and they're saying something. If you've ever wondered what happens in that moment, I'll tell you right now. But first, let me share a passage of scripture with you. In Romans chapter 10, Verse nine, it says this. It says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I don't know about you, but I love it when the Bible just makes something really clear and really, really clean. And it's just like, well, I, wanna, I want to, I know that Jesus is the way. I, I want to go that way. How do I do it? And it's so clear right here, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will 
be saved. It says, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. This concept of declaring your faith, speaking this, this out loud, what we do in that baptistry is I give people an opportunity to, to say what we call, we call it the good confession, a confession of faith. They have an opportunity to speak with their mouth a confession of faith. And here's what they actually say. I have them repeat after me and they say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he came to this earth and lived a perfect life that I could not live and then died on the cross in my place for the forgiveness of my sins. He then rose again three days later so that I can be resurrected too. I have taken Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And in that beautiful moment of declaring out loud to me or whoever's doing the baptism that they've made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of their life, we're able to then baptize them. It's a powerful truth. And here's the thing I know to be true, unfortunately, is there's many people in this room right now that you know that you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And here's what I mean by you, you know that you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You've been trying to make sense of this life on your own. You've been trying to find joy and happiness. You've been trying all the different things the world offers. And by the way, the world sells a really, the, the menu is really long, right? The menu says, hey, maybe you could just try some drinking. That'll bring you some happiness. Try some drugs, try some sex, try some success, try power. Maybe if you just make enough money, you can buy yourself happiness. And the world is, is pitching all sorts of things to you. And what you've learned by now is that as you pursue those things, they, they never seem to fully satisfy. They might bring happiness for a moment, but then the next day you're sitting there feeling empty and you're thinking there's gotta be more to life than this. And here's the truth. Jesus already told us that he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. And no one's gonna find what they're looking for except through him. It reminds me of a passage of scripture in Isaiah. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and this is what he says to the people. He says, why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel forever? Your head is injured, your heart is sick, you are battered from head to foot, covered with bruises, welts, and infected wounds without any soothing ointments or bandages. I don't know about you, I, I, listen, I, this is not a, a literal thing. God is looking at people who are sick, uh, not literally sick, but they've been trying to find meaning in their life. They've been trying to find joy. They've been running after all sorts of things, doing things their own way. And God says, when are you gonna realize that it's not working? Your heart is sick. None of the things you're trying are gonna fully satisfy. You're sitting there broken, be, uh, beaten up on, from head to toe. If you look at it from the perspective of miracles that we've been talking about, you know, Jesus being a healer, like when are you gonna stop trying to heal yourself? From a perspective of being a, a feeder and a provider, Jesus is saying, when are you gonna stop trying to feed yourself? You know, Jesus says that he is the, the living water, that he is the bread of life, that if you eat from that bread, you'll never be hungry again. He's not talking about literal hunger. Obviously, we need to feed ourselves food. But he's saying, listen, I'm the one who can feed you a bread that when you eat from it, you'll never be hungry and thirsty for purpose and joy and meaning in your life ever again. How about the, the idea of Jesus being a storm calmer? We're sitting there with all sorts of chaos in our lives. And we're trying to calm the storm on our own when the truth is Jesus is the one who can say, peace, be still. When are we gonna stop trying to, to heal ourselves, feed ourselves, and calm the storms of our own life? When Jesus has already said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Isaiah goes on in verse 16 and says this, wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. He, he basically says, listen, if you want to get out of this mess that you're in, the very first thing he says is you have to wash yourself and be clean. And we've already learned this morning, right? There's only one way to wash yourself and be clean. 
Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The only way to wash yourself of your brokenness, the only way to get rid of it, is through placing your faith in Jesus. And then what Isaiah, or God says through Isaiah in verse 18, this has got to be the best verse in Isaiah 1. Here it goes. God says simply this, come now, let's settle this. Notice what God doesn't say. He doesn't say, hey, let's make an appointment for next week. He doesn't say, hey, why don't you pray about it? He doesn't say, hey, why don't you talk to some gurus or read some books? Or why don't, you, why don't we, we think about this for a couple hours? No, he says, come now, let's settle this. In fact, if I were writing my own version of the Bible, the Matt International Version, here's what I would say. Isaiah 118 says simply this, what are you waiting for? How long are you going to be bruised and battered without ointment, without any bandages? How long are you going to keep going through life this way when the truth is that Jesus is the way? What are you waiting for? So if you're in this room right now and you've never made a decision to follow Christ, I got one simple question for you. What are you waiting for? Why not come now and settle this? In fact, in just a moment, we're going we're gonna to sing a couple of songs uh, but I, before we do that, I want to I take this really literally this morning. Jesus has been resurrected back to life, and you can be resurrected back to life too. Amen. And so if you're in this room and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to be very bold and to stand up where you are and to come stand in front of this stage. And I know what you're thinking right now. They, it's really tight. I'm going to have a hard time getting out. Or what if I'm the only person who comes forward? Let me tell you two things about that. If you can't be bold for Jesus in a room full of Christians, you're going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard for you out there. And the other thing I want you to know is if you want to know how the church responds when someone wants to give their life to Jesus, let me show you. Yeah. So if you're in this room and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, God is looking at you right now and he's saying, come Let's settle this now. And maybe you're in this room and you've already made a decision to follow Jesus, but you've never been obedient to taking that initial step of obedience in baptism. Well, I want you to know that we have all the things that you would need to get baptized today. I know you came in whatever clothes you're wearing, but you would go backstage. We'll give you a shirt to wear, shorts to wear. We got flip-flops for you. We got a towel for you. And you're going to go in, you get baptized today, and then go put your clothes back on and leave exactly the way you came, except totally different. So let's not delay. If you're in this room right now and you need to give your life to Christ, I want to invite you to come forward right now. Right now. If you need to give your life to Christ right now or you want to get baptized, you need to take that initial step of obedience. Listen, you know who you are. There's, there's, I know there's someone in this room right now that you know you're supposed to be up here. And I would simply say, what are you waiting for? Why are you still sitting there? If, if that's you, it's not too late. I want you to come and join us up here. But what I want to do, and by the way, if, if you're uh, under 18 and you're up here right now, I want to invite a parent to come up here too. I think it would just be helpful if we have a parent for any of our kids up here. Uh, and here's what I want to do. I want to take your good confession right here. I'm going to Repeat these words and you're going to repeat after me. In fact, if you're in this room and you're already a follower of Christ, I want to invite you to say these words as well. Because this is a time that you can, you can repeat this good confession as often as you want because it's a really good one. All right, so here's what I want you to say. And say it nice and loud and boldly and courageously. And church, you can say it along with us. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God that he came to this earth and lived a perfect life that I could not live and then died on the cross in my place for the forgiveness of my sins. 
He then rose again three days later so that I can be resurrected too. I have taken Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Oh, man. You guys realize the weight of what just happened? I want to invite each of you to to go backstage with one of our hosts, and they're just going to talk you through the decision you just made, and just make sure you understand what that means. We're going to sing a couple songs. If you'd like to take that initial step of obedience today and get baptized, uh, let them know you want to do that, and we can make that happen while we sing these last two songs. If you would rather wait and schedule that for next week or a time, we don't want to postpone that, right? We want to be obedient. Uh, But if you aren't ready to make that step today, just let them know, all right? We want to invite you to do that. And by the way, if you're in the room right now and you are supposed to come up, and you don't know why, you're sitting there right now thinking, why did I not have the courage to do that? While we sing these two songs, it's not too late. I want to invite you to come up. I'm going to be over here. I'm going to be doing some baptisms, so you'll know where to find me. And so I just want you to come up and say, I I should have come up. And I'd be happy to, to baptize you today too. Church, let's pray over them. God, thank you so much for this incredible gift of your salvation. Thank you that by simply placing our faith in you, we have access to eternal life and a relationship with you. Thank you for fixing our mess. Thank you for being the way, the truth, and the life that we have restored relationship with the Father because of your death and your burial. And here we are on Resurrection Day because of your resurrection. God, we thank you for your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.